Hallelujah. I believe that God's people are the happiest people on the face of the earth. But you know, some of them just don't know how to show it. They're happy, they just don't know how to show it. But I'm one of those guys, you're going to know where I stand with you. If I'm happy, you're going to know it. And I really don't get sad, so you'll never know that. But God has blessed me. I have no reason to be sad. I have no reason to be sorrowful. God is in charge. God is totally in charge of my life. Whatever He brings, I can rejoice. Amen. While you're still standing, I'm not, I'm not going to preach now. We're not going to preach tonight or this afternoon. But I do want to read one scripture. And then we're going right into the little uh, testimonies and, and uh, little stories that I've, I've got to tell you this morning. Acts, and I think Brother Biskel or somebody read it earlier this week. Acts 1 and 8. And Acts 1 and 8. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Father, we thank you again today. Lord, we want to come and once more we want to express our love to you, Lord. Lord, we want to be found making love to you today. Lord, it's just a testimony service. But God, we know that you're in testimonies. We know that you're in the preaching of the word. We know that, uh, that you're in the song, singing of the songs of Zion. God, you're in all of creation. Lord, we give you praise, glory, and honor today. We pray, pr uh, pray that you would bless this little testimony st service or these little stories that Brother Kenny has to tell. Lord, may they bless somebody. Lord, if one person is blessed by these little stories, then we have made a progress in the kingdom of God today. Lord, we love you. We praise your holy name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Surprised that so many people came back. <laughs> Looks like some didn't. <laughs> Hope I didn't step on their toes. And if I did, they need to be stepped on. This afternoon, I just want to give testimony and, and maybe some, relate some little stories. Um, uh, both, uh, you know, I, I've met the prophet. People ask me, they said, Brother Kenny, uh, how old were you? I said, well, I, look, this is no secret. I was born in 1950. So in 1965, when the prophet died, I was 15 years old. I remember quite a bit. And yes, I did have a chance to meet the prophet, be in his home. So we, maybe we'll tell a couple of those little stories. Um, in, in a small, humble way. I have been privileged to see a few things and know just a few th things that God has done in this generation. But it's not only, we are a privileged generation, every one of us sitting here today. You know, and the Bible tells me, more blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. You know, I've, I've seen a lot of things, a lot of miracles. Sometimes I've questioned God, why? Why did he allow me to see these things? And, it, you know, really, it just speaks to a weakness in me. God knew. I think God knew I had to see what I saw. You know, God's infinite. He knew I had to see what I saw in order to be at this place in my life. But you are more blessed. If you're sitting here and you've never seen those things, you are even more blessed that you can believe them without seeing them. So more blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. I guess he just allowed me to see those things because I had a big mouth. <laughs> he knew I would tell him. <laughs> I wouldn't hold back. Amen. You know, I told Brother, I told Brother Colin Brenner, I said, now, when I do this, I like to do it in an informal setting. You know, I, I, like, to, I like to do this around a campfire, or, you know, in, in somebody's den, you know, and, and uh, just kind of relax a little bit. But I think with this many people, this is about in, as informal as I can get. 
pull my coat off and roll my sleeves up. <laughs> so I guess in some sense I am in an informal setting. Church, I have, I have been privileged to see, see things. And... But before I relate those stories, I'd like to ask my brother Brian to come on the piano. Um, and I'm doing that for this reason. I always remember, Brother George Smith remembers, I always remember growing up at the Branham Tabernacle in Jeffersonville, and we sang this little song. Now, when, when they cut all the singing out of the tapes, maybe some of you younger people have never heard this song. But I want to sing this little song for you. This is a song that we sang as I was growing up at the Branham Tabernacle. And I think, I actually think somebody in Canada uh, wrote it or something. And maybe if somebody here would know and they can tell me. But the little song goes like this. I am a Bible-believing apostolic Christian and a member of the church of the firstborn. I am a Bible-believing apostolic Christian and a member of the church of the firstborn. Praise God, I've been in this church since the foundation of this earth. And that is why I have taken Jesus' name. I am a Bible-believing apostolic Christian and a member of the church of the firstborn. I am a Bible-believing apostolic Christian and a member of the church of the firstborn. Praise God, I've been in this church since the foundation of this earth that is why i have taken jesus name now if you read acts two and four and refuse to read any more there's an eye watching you you'll have trouble at the gate about acts 238 if I were you, I'd make the change. I am a Bible be sing with me, believing apostolic Christian and a member of the church of the firstborn. I am a Bible believing apostolic Christian and a member of the church of the firstborn. Praise God, I've been in this church since the foundation of this earth and that is why i have taken jesus name now here's the verse i like our prophet william branham has said o'er and o'er make haste oh bride it's later than you think get ready for the bridegroom, he's coming very soon. We'll fly through the air, but we won't stop at the moon. <laughs> I am a Bible-believing, apostolic Christian, and a member of the church of the firstborn. I am a Bible-believing, apostolic Christian, and a member of the church of the firstborn. Praise God, I've been in this church since the foundation of this earth. That is why I have taken Jesus' name. I'm going to sing that last verse again. Our prophet William Branham has said o'er and o'er, Make haste, O oh bride, it's later than you think. Get ready for the bridegroom, he's coming very soon. We'll fly through the air, but we won't stop at the moon. I am a Bible-believing apostolic Christian and a member of the church of the firstborn. I am a Bible-believing apostolic Christian and a member of the church of the firstborn. Praise God, I've been in this church 
since the foundation of this earth. And that is why I have taken Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you. My voice is pretty much gone, but uh, I thank you for allowing me to do that today. Well, let's see. Where do I start? <laughs> um, I have seen many, many, many what I call general miracles. I'm talking about, I have seen um, twisted limbs made straight, automatic, right on the spot, instantly. I've seen blinded eyes open on the spot, instantly. I've seen all kind of healings, instant healings. I've seen healings where they weren't instant. They weren't maybe miracles like that, and and. Two weeks later or three days later, they would come back and claim their healing. Um, I've seen many, many people brought into the services on stretchers and cots and, uh, and, and seen them get up and walk out on their own. But, you know, and I can't, I don't know all those people. Uh, we, had, we had two different crowds when I was growing up at the Tabernacle. We had the, the crowd that uh, was, lived there and went there on a regular basis. Then we had the, the huge crowds that came in uh, when Brother Branham was in town. Brother George was one of those. He wasn't a regular. He was just one of those that came in when Brother Branham came in. But we always counted him as one of us. <laughs> but we, uh, we had two different crowds. And uh, now, a lot of people that came in from just for the meetings, I didn't know them. Uh, didn't know their name. I knew they got healed, but I, I'm going to dwell today on those that I did know, most of the local people that I knew, and that we knew for a fact that they were, they were having problems, and they spoke to the, the man of God, and they, they were healed. So you bear with me this morning. Pray for me. Uh, <laughs> growing up in Jeffersonville, Indiana in the 50s and 60s, we lived in such an atmosphere of faith. Anything that happened, anything that the devil brought, would bring into our lives, we knew if we could get a hold of that prophet, he could speak the word. It's much like the prophet Elisha when he spoke to the little widow woman or, or all the great prophets when they spoke to somebody and, and, and spoke the word and it became manifested. So that's the, that's the uh, atmosphere that we grew up in. And uh, the first one I will tell you about my brother Dennis's healing. My brother was uh, uh, five years younger than me. And uh, when he got to be about 12 years old, he got sick. And the family took him to the doctor. And uh, the doctor couldn't find out what was wrong with him. So they took him home. And he kept getting sicker and sicker. And so, so then after a few days, they took him to another doctor. He had great pain. And... Uh, he just still kept getting sicker. They didn't know what was wrong with him. Finally, it got so bad and the pain got so bad that they rushed him to the hospital one night, the emergency room. And in the emergency room, they did some tests and some scans and everything. And they found out that his appendix had burst. And that there was uh, poison from those bursted appendix running all through his body. And I was standing there and the doctor came out of the emergency room. He turned to my father and he said, Mr. Caps, he said, I'm sorry to tell you, your son's appendix had bursted. He said, there's too much poison in his body. He said, he probably won't live till morning. Many of you parents have been in those situations. And, you know, it was strange. My father didn't get real excited. He just, after the doctor left, he said, we got to call Brother Branham. So at that time, they had the pay phones. He went with a pay phone and started putting coins in the pay phone. And he called Brother Random's house. But there was no answer. And still, he didn't get too excited. He said, well, he said, I'll call Billy. Billy will know where he's at. So he called Billy's house, Billy Paul's house. And uh, Billy answered the phone. I was standing by him. My father said, uh, Billy, Billy. He said, do uh, you know where your father is? He said, they say my son's going to die. He said, I need to speak with your father. And uh, Brother Billy said, well, 
I, I don't know exactly, Brother Caps, but he said, uh, he said, um, Daddy went target shooting with Joseph. He said, uh, I don't know when they'll be back, but said, uh, whenever I see him today, I'll have him call you. Well, he got ready to hang up the phone. And Billy said, wait a minute, Brother Caps. He said, Daddy just pulled in the driveway. Brother Branham came to the phone. Now, we found out later the reason he stopped at Billy's house was because he and Joseph were out target shooting. And this is the first time that he had outshot his dad. In other words, he had shot better than his dad. And so Joseph was excited because he had done better than his dad. And he wanted to go by Billy's house to tell his big brother that he had beat his dad in target shooting. But we know the real reason. <laughs> the real reason is because <laughs> Brother Branham could speak to the situation. So Brother Branham came to the phone. And, and uh, of course, I heard my father's side of the conversation. And I was told later the other side. But my father said... Uh, Brother Branham, he said, I need to talk to you. He said, the doctors say my son's going to die. He may die before morning. He said, Brother Branham, would you pray? And still he wasn't really excited. We just didn't get excited about those things because we knew the prophet would take care of it. And he said, would you pray and, 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 and that God would heal the boy, you know? And uh, he said, told me later, he said, Brother Branham did not even pray. He just said, Thus saith the Lord, Brother Caps, your son won't die. Your son shall live. Amen. My brother went home the next morning. He lives today in Kokomo, Indiana. There was a time when Brother Brandon was in a meeting in Louisville, Kentucky at the Church of the Open Door. And uh, my grandfather really wasn't a message person. He really wasn't a believer. But he was a Christian. So he went over to the church there to see, uh, to see the man of God. And he had been having heart problems. And uh, the doctors didn't expect him to live. He, he had a bad heart. And then at this time, my, my grandfather was in his late 40s. And uh, he was sitting in the meeting there in that church. And now Brother Ram did not call his name, but he said, there's a man sitting back, way back, in about the 18th row, I think it is. And he said, he's got on a gray suit. He's got on a gray and red tie. He said, oh, brother, he said, the, the Lord shows me you've got a bad heart. The doctor said you won't last long. He said, God heals your heart. Go home and be made well. My grandfather lived to be in his 80s before he died. And there's another little story about my grandfather I'll relate while I'm there. And I don't have any particular order. I'm just, I told my wife coming over, I said, you know, I need to get all these things organized and, and, uh, and, and put my notes together a little better. And she said, well, you're going to have to start using your iPad, I guess. <laughs> but uh, my grandfather... Uh, my dad, uh, and I suppose, I suppose most of you know, my father was Brother Branham's uh, song leader when he was in Jeffersonville. He was uh, Brother Neville's assistant. Uh, he was the adult Sunday school teacher at the Tabernacle. He, uh, he, he preached most, when Brother Branham wasn't in town, Brother Neville would preach Sunday morning and usually my father would preach Sunday night. And uh, now, when my father was a boy growing up, his parents, my grandparents, lived in Burksville, Kentucky. And I hope every one of you know where Brother Branham was born. <laughs> in Burksville, Kentucky. So it was kind of strange. That they, were, they, were, they came from the same area. And then when, uh, when my father was just a little boy. Like when Brother Branham was a little boy. Uh, my grandparents moved to Jeffersonville. The same thing that Brother Branham's parents did. I don't know. I'm not trying to make something out of that. I'm just saying it's kind of odd. But uh, my great grandfather down in Burksville, Kentucky. Was a Methodist circuit rider. And I think most of you know what that is. He would ride around from village to village and on horseback. And he would preach at churches along the way. 
Uh, my grandfather, my, that was my great grandfather. My grandfather was not a preacher, but then my dad became a preacher. And uh, my grandfather had left the Methodist church and joined the Nazarene church. So my father grew up in the Nazarene church. And uh, he, was, he had been ordained in the Nazarene church. And, he was, and then he, he uh, in Jeffersonville, he started hearing about Brother Branham and the message. And he tells many stories of seeing Brother Branham out around town and so forth. And, uh, but he, uh, he was working in Chicago, Illinois. And my, uh, uh, our Brother Branham was in, uh, the, I think it was Mather High School Auditorium in Chicago, Illinois. And he went and visited. And the Lord got a hold of him. And so he, he grabbed a hold of the message. And he'd been serving the, uh, serving the Lord in the message for many years. So he began praying. He began praying for his father, my grandfather. And uh, we would pray as a family. He would pray, you know, Lord, give dad, give granddad the, the revelation of the message. He wanted him to come out of the Nazarene church and come into the message. But even in the late 60s, in 1965, it still hadn't happened. And so he had an interview with Brother Branham one time. And he said, Brother Branham, can you tell me something about my father? He said, I keep witnessing to him. I want him to come out of that Nazarene system. I want him to come to the message. He said, can you tell me something about my father? And he said, Brother Branham sat in the office there, and he had a way of looking up for just a minute or so. And he looked back at my father, and he said, oh, Brother Katz. He said, the Lord shows me your father. He said, don't worry about your father. He'll be there. He said, now, Brother Caps, he said, let me explain why. He said, your father came up under the Wesleyan message. He said, that's all he's responsible for. But said, he'll be there on that day. Now, and I've thought a lot about that. 65, the seals had been opened. We had the full revealed word. And yet my grandfather was still in the Nazarene church. The prophet said he'd be there. Could it be that we're a little quick to judge sometimes? You know, I hear, years ago I heard many times people say, Oh, don't, don't mess with them. They're just in Pentecost. Hey, there may be some people. Now, granted, they would probably be old people. But there may be some people who was raised in Pentecost and they'll be there. Because that's their message, and that's all they're responsible for. I'm just saying it could be. So we shouldn't be so quick to put people in and put people out. But that one little interview with Brother Branham that I later heard about convinced me I don't have all the answers. And I don't know everything. So I try to just love everybody, share what I can with people. And just go about my business. We had some stories of some personal friends. Oh, let me just say this before I do that. How many here has heard about Hattie Wright? <laughs> I knew Hattie Wright. Uh, there's not too many people alive today who can say that. But I knew Hattie Wright. Uh, those two boys that received their salvation were friends of mine. Now, my brother-in-law had horses. And we would go riding horses. And they lived about 10 miles from Hattie Wright. So whenever the, the horses needed to have new shoes put on them, we would ride the horses over to Hattie Wright's house. And the boys would put, those two boys, they would uh, put new shoes on the horses. And I've been in Hattie Wright's house. And when I was in it, it was still a dirt floor. She didn't have anything. Just poor as poor as could be. But she was a real true believer. And I believe with all my heart that Hattie Wright is a type of the bride of Jesus Christ. If the bride can get to the point where they say, that's nothing but the truth, Brother Branham. Then I think we've made progress. Hattie Wright was not much to look at. 
I'm sorry, I don't know about your new shoes and your new suit and your new dress, but the bride ain't too much to look at sometimes. But she wasn't much to look at. She'd come to church, and she'd have old grandma clothes on, and she was a cook, and she'd have sometimes food on her dress, and she had long hair, and sometimes she didn't have much style to it. She just kind of piled it up on her head, and it was going everywhere. And she only had one tooth left in her head. And as a small kid, in my early years, most of us kids were f- afraid of her. Because <laughs> she just, she wasn't a, well, she's just an old, ugly woman. That's all she was, all you can say about it. And boy, they, they really, people really hit me for that, saying that Hattie Wright was an ugly woman. But that was my impression at the time. But I've, I've noticed how that when we would have the big meetings and Brother Bannon would come in town after church, There would be all these big ministers, some from Texas with their big cowboy hat and their boots, their nice fine suits, and they'd all be gathered around Hattie Wright. They'd all go around asking, now which one is Hattie Wright? Which one is Hattie Wright? And so somebody would point out Hattie, and she always had a crowd around her. And she had to always tell the story. Well, she said, when Brother Branham said he spoke those squirrels into his kids, she said, I knew it was true. She said, she said, uh, it had to be true because he said it. And she said, he said, Hattie, for this saying, I give you the desire of your heart. He said, you can have your, your sister's health. You can have money. You can have uh, uh, your, your mother and father extend their life. He said, whatever you say is the way it will be. And she said, I just... I just looked at him and I said, Brother Branham, my greatest desire in my heart is to see my boy saved. Well, you know the story. Those two boys were friends of mine. Uh, And in case you do, most of you probably know this by now. But people would come into town and they say, I want to see those two right boys. Well, they weren't right boys. Their last name was Mosier. And so people, they, they'd spend many hours trying to find out those right boys. There was no right boys. Because what had happened, Hattie Wright, that was her maiden name. And Brother Branham knew the family and he'd always known her as little Hattie Wright. And that's what he called her. Well, she had gotten married. She had those two boys and her husband died just very shortly after those two boys came along. So the boys were actually Mosiers. They were Arvel Mosier and Coy Mosier. But everybody was looking for Hattie Wright's boys. They couldn't find them. So, uh, and, and if you've got one of George's books, the generation book, one of those boys is in there and it gives his real name. So we, we, we knew those boys and, and the, listen, they were rough boys. They were country boys. They didn't shave very often, maybe twice a year. And they didn't care about nice clothes. I don't think either one of them ever owned a suit. And uh, they'd come to church. My, they were rough. Seemed like they didn't even comb their hair, you know. But they're just rough country boys. And one of them started liking my sister. He tried to, he tried to be a boyfriend to my sister. And she was so embarrassed. She said, keep him away from me. <laughs> But, you know, those boys, they were good boys. After, you know, they actually had given their, their life to the Lord at a very early age when that event happened. So I knew them as teenager, teenage boys. Uh, very rough. You know, they've had a rough life. One of them's been married uh, three times, I think. But you can't tell me that those boys aren't saved. Because one of them died last year. But I believe that there's ever two boys that's going to be there. Those two boys will. How many, how many of you remember who Banks Woods was? Brother Banks Woods was Brother Branham's best friend. He lived next door to him. There was Brother Branham's house, there was an empty field, and then there was Brooke Banks Woods' house. And he became Brother Branham's best friend. They traveled together, they hunted together, they did everything together. And there's quite an interesting story about Brother Banks. 
Because people have said, and maybe you've heard it, I've heard it. People have said, boy, it was a shame about Brother Banks, wasn't it? I said, what are you talking about? Well, Brother, Brother Banks, he left the message. He backslid. I said, man, you're crazy. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't backslide. But it's true. When Brother Branham died, I think it was like the next week, he went down to the church and he resigned his position as trustee. And he left the church. As far as anybody knows, he never went to the Branham Tabernacle again. So they started get, making rumors about him. He left the message. He left the church. He, he backslid. He did this. He did that. And so we heard this for, we probably heard this for several months. So finally my dad was, my dad was friends with him also. So he said, come on, Kenny. He said, we're going to go see Brother Banks. So he went to Brother Banks' house. Knocked on the door, and Brother Banks come to the door. He said, Brother Banks, he said, I'm concerned about you. He said, people are saying this about you and saying that about you. He said, is everything all right? Brother Banks said, yeah, Brother Caps, everything's fine. He said, well, we haven't seen you around the church. We heard you resigned. He said, uh, are you sure everything's all right? Brother Banks started laughing. He said, Brother Caps, I've got to tell you the story. And I was standing there and heard him tell my dad the story. He said... Not long before Brother Branham died, he said he came over to my house one day. He walked in and he said, Brother Banks, I want to talk to you. He said, this is very important. Now I want you to listen to me. He said, I'm not going to be with you long. He said, the Lord's going to take me. And he said, when you've heard that the Lord has taken me, I want you to do something. In fact, he says, you have to do something. He said, you have to leave the tabernacle. And you have to take your wife, Sister Ruby, and you have to go back to Louisville to the Assembly of God Church there. Almost impossible to believe, you know. He said, I know it's hard to believe, Brother Caps, but he said, that's exactly what happened. He said, he told me, he said, Brother Banks, if you don't do what I tell you, he said, you're going to lose your wife, Sister Ruby. He said, now she's already had two nervous breakdowns. And he said, after I'm gone... He said, there's going to be so much fanaticism rise up about my message. He said, they're going to drive your wife crazy. He said, it will destroy her nerves. He said, you're going to lose your wife if, I don't, if you don't do what I tell you. He said, now take her back to Brother Rogers Church, which was the Assembly of God pastor in Louisville, Kentucky. He said, that's the church she grew up in as a little girl. And he said, you're to take her there. And you're to stay there in that church. And she, that will be a comfort to her. Nobody will know where to find her. Nobody will, will uh, be able to uh, get a hold of her. And he said, you'll be able to save your wife. So Brother Banks, seeing what he's seen, knowing what he knew, he knew well enough to do what a prophet of God said. I wonder how many of us really know enough to do what a prophet of God said. When he said, sisters, don't cut your hair. When he said, brothers, put away those cigarettes. Quit deceiving people. Don't be a hypocrite. Church, some of us better start doing what he says. But he, Brother Banks took his wife, Sister Ruby... And they went back to Brother Rogers Church in Louisville, Kentucky. They put a big fence up around their house. You couldn't get in to knock on their door. All people tried. All they had reports of people craw crawling over the fence and everything else. Fanaticism. But Brother Banks did what a prophet of God told him to do. And they actually she outlived him. I think he died about 10 years ago. She died about 7 years ago. But uh, they were doing what the prophet of God said to do. We have another friend. The West family. And the West family were from, they were from New Mexico. And they would come to the meetings in Jeffersonville, Indiana. It's a long drive. And they had a daughter named Rebecca West. 
And during the Parkview meetings, if you remember the story, the Parkview meetings was in an auditorium. And on this side, they had the nice auditorium seats, the padded seats, the cushioned seats. But on this side, they had a gymnasium. And they had seats, chairs, much like what you're sitting in here. And Brother Branham, when he would preach on the stage, sometimes he would look to this side, and sometimes he would look to this side. But he was preaching to both sides. In this particular night, I think it was during marriage and divorce, he was looking this way, and he, was, he had finished the sermon, he was starting to do the discernment. He was looking this way, and he goes, oh! He said, the Lord shows me. Oh, I see. It's a little girl. Oh, the family's from New Mexico. He said, the little girl, two years old. Oh, he said, she's got a cleft palate, which means she doesn't have a roof in her mouth. And she couldn't talk. He said, oh, he said, oh, it's the West family, Brother West from New Mexico. He said, Brother West, he said, God will heal your daughter. But then he said, it'll come slowly. It'll be many years before she's totally healed. Well, she really still couldn't talk. She was uh, not in pain or anything after that. But the West family, and, and, and within just a, a year or two after Brother Branham died, my dad went up to northern Indiana and started his own church. And the West family, they fell in love with our family. They fell in love with my father and mother. And, and so they decided to move from New Mexico to Indiana, where my father had a church. And so... Time went on, and Rebecca West, the little two-year-old that Brother Branham spoke about, she got to be about 13 years old. And one Sunday, they came to church, and they just started rejoicing in church. The cleft palate had been fully healed. She actually, God had recreated the mouth of the, uh, the roof of the mouth. She could talk normally. Everything was normal. And she lives in Muncie, Indiana. And don't you all put me out of the message for this. But I'm a friend of hers on Facebook. <laughs> and her name is Rebe Rebecca West Coleman. And if you want to get a hold of her, I'm sure she'd be glad to tell you the story. The testimony. But we've seen all kind of things like that happen. Uh, we, we had a real close family that was friends of ours there. It was the Shepherd family. And I'm sure you probably read about it, this in the message. But the Shepherd family, they had two boys. One boy was uh, three years older than me. I think the other boy was two years older than me. But Brother Shepherd, the dad, he had been very sick. And... Uh, she had told, the mother had, or the wife had told my, my mother and different ones there. She says, I don't know what we're going to do about Alex. She says, uh, he's convinced he's, he's got a bad heart or bad back or whatever. Well, I think it's a bad back. And he's convinced he's going to die because he can't live in this pain any longer. And uh, so everybody in the church, they knew the story. But nobody that came in in the, in the big crowd when Brother Branham was there, they really didn't know the story. And so the, the, the mother or the wife had, had told everybody, said, we were out shopping the other day and said, I wanted Alex to buy a new pair of shoes. And he said, oh, I'm not buying no new pair of shoes. He said, I'm not going to spend the money. He said, he said I'm going to die. I don't need a new pair of shoes. She said, oh, Alex, don't talk like that. He said, no, I'm going to die. He said, I don't need, he wouldn't buy the new pair of shoes. Now, the story came back later. She never told Brother Branham that story. So one Sunday morning, I'm sitting about six or seven rows back. And what you have to understand at the Branham Tabernacle at that time, they had a baptistry pool behind the pulpit, and they had a curtain back there. You really couldn't see unless the curtains were open. But the, the crowds were so great that they would set chairs 
in the baptistry. I think they had a, a, a board or something. They'd set chairs back there. And, and they would have many people sitting back in the baptistry. They couldn't see Brother Branham. He couldn't see them. So he's preaching one morning. And he stops in the middle of his service. And he says, oh, he said, there's a brother. He's, he's got serious back problem. I think it was back. He said, he's got serious back problem. He said, the Lord's going to heal him. And he kind of looked up, you know, and he, he said, oh, he said, it's our precious brother Shepherd." Oh, and he's back in the baptistry behind the curtain. He said, oh, he said, I see. He said, he was out shopping with his wife. She wanted him to buy a new pair of shoes, and he wouldn't buy the shoes because he thought he was going to die. He said, Brother Shepherd, go home and be healed. Yeah. These are people where I, that I knew. A lot of things I didn't know. I, knew, I saw it happen, but I didn't know them. But these are people that I knew. And I may just, I don't know. If, look, some of these stories are going to sound real spiritual. Some of them are not. <laughs> some of them are funny. Some of them are sad. And some of them are just stupid. <laughs> Brother Shepherd had two teenage boys. One was three years older than me and one was two. And a couple years after their dad was healed, we were out playing basketball. Oh, we love basketball in America. We were out playing basketball, shooting basketball, you know. And uh, so let's, let's go to town, get something cold to drink. Sure, okay. We live probably eight blocks from town. So we're walking down the street one summer day. Walking down the street, you know, just how teenage boys do. Get up here. Come here. Come here. We're walking down the street. Teenage boys. And we're just carrying on. You know, pushing each other, shoving each other. You know, we're just having a good time. We're friends, right? Go ahead, brother. Thank you. Walking down the street. And, you know, just teenage boys, they're just... Crazy acting sometimes. I know now boys in Europe don't do that probably. <laughs> We're walking down the street. Y'all don't, don't put me out of the message for this either. But I'm just telling the truth, okay? We're walking down the street. We're just carrying on, pushing, shoving, you know. And looked over here. One of the boys seen Brother Brandon driving down the street in the station wagon. Had his windows down. It's a hot day, you know. Hey, Brother Random, how you doing? All right, boys, how you doing? <laughs> he said, where are you boys going? I said, we're going to town, Brother Random. Going to get a Coke, Coca-Cola. He said, that's where I'm going. He said, you want a ride? Sure, Brother Random, we take a ride. So we get in Brother Random's car, right? Now, the oldest boy gets in the front seat next to Brother Branham, and me and the youngest boy, we're sitting in the back. And so we're riding along, and the oldest boy in the front seat, he turns around to us younger boys, and he said, hey, boys. He said, when I say duck down, he said, duck down where you can't be seen. Well, you know, it's a law. As a teenager, if an older teenage boy tells you to do something, you have to do it, right? I mean, you just have to do it. He said, duck down. When I say duck down, duck down. And about that time, I looked out the window, and there was a girl walking down the street, and she's only about half dressed. Oh, she was dressed poorly. Uh, very poorly dressed, very immodest. And uh, about that time, the older shepherd boy, he turned around and us. He said, duck down. Well, we all duck down. And he ducks down in the, fr in, the, in the front. And about that time, he lets out a big wolf whistle. 
he lets out a big long whistle at that half naked girl. Well, we're ducked down. It makes it look like Brother Branham whistled at the girl. <laughs> well, we went on by. We started laughing. Man, we just laughing. We was having so much. <laughs> and looked up here and Brother Branham was laughing. <laughs> oh, he said, that's a good one, boys. That's a good one. <laughs> then he said, boys, don't you ever do that again. And he wasn't laughing. And we stopped laughing. <laughs> and I never did it again. <laughs> There's one of those stupid stories I was talking about. Um, you know, there's a famous story. There's a famous story in the message, and I'm sure many of you heard but probably all of you have heard it. I think it took place in Germany. And it might have taken place over here at Karlsruhe. I don't know, but you would probably be able to tell me. There's a famous story where Brother Branham was praying for people, and a little blind girl came up, and she had no eyeballs. You all know, was, did that happen in Germany? I thought it did, yeah. Okay. And uh, you know the story then. She, she, was, she didn't have any eyeballs. And she came up before Brother Branham, and, and I don't remember it in detail, but it was something like this. He said... Uh, Honey, if you had eyes, what color would you like? And she said something about, I think blue, wasn't it blue? Yeah. And so the prophet of God prayed for her, and she turned around, and, and she had eyes. God had created eyeballs for that young sister. I did not see that. But... In about, I think it was the fall of 1964, I believe it was, Brother Branham had come back to Jeffersonville for a meeting, and there was another little girl, and she was blind. Now, she had eyeballs, but she was blind. And I was sitting just maybe four or five rows back, and I saw very clearly what happened. And she walked up, her and her mother walked up before Brother Branham. He said, oh, he said, the child is blind. He said, God bless you, mother. He said, oh, he said, this precious little sister. He said, little sister, do you believe that God can give you back your sight? And the mother was saying yes, and the girl was saying yes. He said, now I want everybody in here to close your eyes. He said, because if you don't close your eyes, he said, God's going to heal her, and you may have the sickness. And I was sitting there, and I watched that little girl turn around, and she started screaming. I can see. I can see. And the mother was screaming. I saw that with my own eyes. Church, a man can't do that. A man cannot do that. It takes God to do that. And I keep referring to my notes here. Let's see what else we got We uh, went to the tabernacle there for a lot of years, and it was always strange in the late 50s and the early 60s that I remember, because late 50s and early 60s, that's right, because church would start, I think it started at 1030, but in order to get a seat, you had to get there about 4.30 in the morning. And so you, you could arrive at 5 and 5.30 and the crowds would be so great at, at the front door. And they would just be waiting to get in. And uh, in later years, they actually reserved a seat for Brother Branham's family and my dad's family. And we, we, we didn't have to wait in that line because they would save us a seat. But, but in, the, in, that, in those first years, we would get there real early. and We'd have to wait in line like everybody else. And then when the doors would open, they'd open them usually about 8. People would just rush in. Now, you all heard the story of Brother Ben Bryant. Brother Ben Bryant was 
a big supporter of Brother Branham. He was a huge mountain man. And uh, he had, Brother Branham told the story where he had been in the war and he'd gotten uh, uh, shrapnel, I think it was, shell fragments in his head. And he wasn't, just wasn't quite, he was a good guy, just qu- wasn't quite right though. And uh, he, he was a big, tall, he must have been about six foot six. Uh, very big, tall guy, big guy, great big guy. And many times when those doors would open, he would push people, he would push ladies, he would push little girls. He didn't care. He, had, he said, I've got to be on the front seat for my prophet. And that's where he ended up every time. And there was many times where he couldn't be in the aisle to get up in one of the front seats, and he would actually step over the pews <laughs> until he got to the front. He was going to make sure he got to the front. One funny little story. I'm in Jeffersonville one day, and this is in the 70s. Brother Branham's done gone. Ben's still there. I'm downtown Jeffersonville, and I see a big crowd over here in front of J.C. Penney's. So I, I go over, and I want to see what's going on. So I look, go over and look, and I look, and there's a man down on all fours, and he's barking like a dog. And I looked closer, and it was Brother Ben Bryan. And he was down on all fours. He started barking like a dog, just a barking. Arr, 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 you know, people look at him like he's weird. They're about half scared of him. And then he would stand up. He stood up, and he said, now that I've got your people's attention, he said, I want to tell you about God sending a prophet. <laughs> he was dedicated, wasn't he? <laughs> you know, I, I just kind of walked away. <laughs> well, that was old Ben Bryant. He was a rough character. I told you, my family came from Burksville, Kentucky. And I would go down in the summertime and visit my grandmother. So one summer, I went down to visit my grandmother. And I decided that I was going to research and find a copy of Brother Branham's birth certificate. I thought, now this is, you know how we do in the message, this is something nobody else has got. I can get this, you know. So I went down to the courthouse, and I started searching through files, and I couldn't find anything. So I went to the lady at the desk, and I said, ma'am, I said, I can't find what I'm looking for. And she said, what are you looking for? And I said, I'm looking for the record of a birth uh, of a man I know. She goes, well, those kind of records are over here in the microfiche file, which was what they used at that time. I said, okay. So I went over there, and I looked through there, and I couldn't find anything. And she, I went back to her, and I said, I just can't. She said, what are you looking for? I said, I'm looking for the man, a record of birth for a man in their ni- uh, that was born in 1909. She goes, oh, honey, she says, you won't find those records. She says, we had a fire here in 1921, and it burned up all those records. But a little later, a few years later, when I heard that people were leaving the message because they didn't believe the story about the bridge, you remember that? I thought, my God, we can't even prove the man was alive. What are you worrying about a bridge for? (laughs) But about that story about the bridge... There's a lot of reasons, a lot of things that can be said about why people don't find a record of that in the newspapers. In the first place, back in that time, labor unions were very, very strong. And they actually controlled the press. They controlled the newspaper business. And the labor unions were having problems finding people to work on the bridge because you're over a hundred feet over the water and it was a very dangerous job. And so there's people there that will tell you and we actually found a witness that actually saw people fall off the bridge. And you've probably seen it on the Voice of God website. 
And, uh, but the newspapers were controlled by the labor unions. And, it's, and I don't know this to be a fact, but it's very likely they didn't want the word to get out that people had been killed working on the bridge because they would have a problem getting people to do the work. We don't know for sure. But um, give me a minute. I'm past 25 the second time. I became very concerned, and others did, because we heard, had reports of people leaving. So a friend of mine, he, he said, Brother Kenny, what about this? He said, what can we do to, what can we do to turn this thing around? He said, you was born there. He said, uh, do you remember anything about that time? I said, yeah. I said, I remember a lot. I said, uh, I remember the mayor, who the mayor was at that time. He said, well, why don't you check around and see what you can find? So uh, I wrote a letter. First I called, then I wrote a letter to the Jeffersonville uh, City Hall. And I asked if that man was still alive that was mayor when Brother Branham was alive. And uh, they responded that, no, that man wasn't still alive, but his son was an attorney in town. And so the other brother and I, we contacted the attorney and he began telling the story. And I've, I suppose most of you have seen the story. Um, we talked to the attorney and he wrote us a letter how that his family was good friends with Brother Branham and his family actually owned the Jefferson Villa Motel where many of the people stayed. And he told the story about how, many, how that many, many, many sick people would come in They'd be on cots or stretchers. They'd be sick. And they'd come into the motel. And they'd, they'd go to the meetings. And they'd come back and they weren't sick anymore. And they knew that this was a man of God. And uh, so then he told the story about back in that day. He remembers his grandmother talking about them building that bridge. And he said his grandmother and another woman would go down and sit on the riverbank and watch the bridge being built. Because there was nothing else to do in that day. They didn't have TV and, and there just wasn't much going on in Jeffersonville. I don't think there's a whole lot going on now. But but he said grandma and her friend would go down and sit on the riverbank. And watch the bridge being built. And he said they were down there one day. And they saw some men. Fall off that bridge. And they went in the concrete that had been poured. You couldn't say. There's no way they could ever recover them. He said they saw that. So he said yes. He said that's true. That's true Mr. Caps. He said if Billy. He called him Billy. He said if Billy Branham says that. He said that's true. That's exactly right. But people. Because they can't prove something. Because you can't prove something don't mean it's not true. I can't prove the man was alive. But that don't mean it's not true. But that's one of the little stories that we get into sometimes. You know how it is. People think they know better than a prophet. What time is, somebody tell me what time is lunch? A dinner. One hour, okay. Let me tell you, because this takes just a little while. Let me tell you about the time I first met Brother Branham. Now, this is a funny story. George has heard it many times. I believe it was 1965, I think it was. And, and uh, as you know, Brother Branham went out west in the fall. And he would, after, after school uh, let out, out in Arizona, he would bring the family back to Jeffersonville. Well, that year they, 
he brought the family back to Jeffersonville. Now, you know, we had all these kids around Jeffersonville there, and we'd all go to the tabernacle, and we were friends. And, and sometimes we'd have little boyfriends and girlfriends, you know. And not, not, nothing serious, just friendships, you know. But one day, my buddy, Frankie Neville, Brother Neville's son, he brings me a note. And this note has written on it, Dear Kenny, I like you. Do you like me? <laughs> and there was two little boxes there. One you could check yes, and one you could check no. <laughs> he said, here, he said, uh, Sarah Branham gave this to Ruth Collins to give to me to give to you. He said, what are you going to do with it? I said, I don't know. He said, do you like her? I said, I guess. He said, check yes. So I checked yes. And I gave it back to him. And he gave it back to Ruth Collins. And she gave it back to Sarah Branham. So I guess we were official friends then, you know. And uh, so this went on. I didn't, you know, I didn't get any more notes for a while. And. Next thing I know, my friend Frankie Neville, he comes to me and he says, Kenny, Sarah wants to go out with you. I'm pretty dumb. I didn't know what going out was, you know. I said, what? She wants to go out with you. I said, what's that mean? He said, well, she wants to go somewhere with you. I said, why? <laughs> she wants to spend time with you. I said, how would we do that? He said, she told me she would take care of it. <laughs> so the next thing I know, Charlie Branham comes to me. Now, you, you may not know who Charlie. Brother Branham's brother was Doc Branham. He was the uh, Sunday school superintendent of the church. And he was the uh, custodian of the church. And he had two boys. He had one boy named Charlie and one, one boy named Mike. Well, Charlie was three years older than I am. Now, I'm, I'm only 15. Charlie's three years older than I am. He's, he's 18. He's got a car. He's got a girlfriend. So Charlie comes to me. He said, Kenny, you know Sarah wants to go out with you. And I said, yeah, I heard that. He said, you going to go? And I go, I don't know. He said, you ought to go. He said, look. Sarah said, you, you two can go with me and Linda, and, and, and we'll go out and eat or something. He said, are you going to go? And I go, well, I don't know. I was a little nervous about it, you know. And he said, oh, go ahead and go. I said, all right, I'll go, I'll go, you know. And he said, well, I'll set it up. I said, okay. So he comes back a week later, and he says, hey, Kenny. He said, if you go out with Sarah, you got to meet with Brother Branham. <laughs> or he called him Uncle Bill. You've got to go see Uncle Bill and have a meeting with Uncle Bill. I said, that is, that's it. I ain't going. <laughs> <laughs> nope, nope, not me. I said, I ain't going. He said, no, you got to go. She wants to go. And I said, I ain't going. Not doing it. And let me tell you why. I didn't tell him. But you see, as a kid, we weren't allowed to have comic books in our house. But I would sneak away, and I would go to the corner drugstore, and I'd stand there on Saturday morning and read the comic books. I'd read about Superman and all those heroes, you know. But I always knew that Brother Brandon was the real Superman. And I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> My parents... <laughs> Gave me 50 cents a day for lunch. Half a dollar. Man, we could eat good back then. And I would take that 50 cents. And I'd go to school. And I'd gamble with the boys. I gambled my money. Man, there was many days I'd go home with three or four dollars. There was many days I didn't get to eat lunch. <laughs> And you know what? 
I was telling little stories that wasn't too nice at school. I knew that if Brother Branham came close to me, he would know everything about me. And I ain't going. He said, I mean, they tried for two weeks. He said, come on, you can go. It's all right. Just talk to Uncle Bill. I said, I'm not going. I can't do it. I don't want to meet him. Finally, finally, after about two weeks, two and a half weeks, they convinced me. Brother, or Charlie came to me and he said, listen, Kenny. He said, I've talked with Uncle Bill. He said, you don't have to meet Uncle Bill. He said, but now will you go out? Sarah wants to go out. They're only going to be here for the summer. He said, will you go out with her? I said, if I don't have to meet Brother Branham, I'll go out. He said, all right, I'll set it up. So, I guess he got everything set up. He, he called me. He said, Friday night. He said, now his girlfriend lived out of town. He said, I'll pick you up. I only live two miles from Brother Branham. He said, I'll pick you up. We'll go to Brother Branham's, or Uncle Bill's house, and we'll get Sarah. And we will uh, then go get my girlfriend, Linda. He said, is that all right? Can you do that? I said, okay, sounds good. You know, we got a plan, right? So Charlie comes and picks me up. Now, Charlie has got a 59 Oldsmobile. And a 59 Oldsmobile is about as long as that wall right there. <laughs> and uh, it was summertime. The windows were down. The birds were singing. And he picked me up. And we drove to Brother Branham's house. And I started to get real nervous. I really started to get nervous. I said, maybe this wasn't a good idea. He said, too late now. He pulled into Brother Branham's driveway, and he sat there, and I sat there, and I sat there. He said, you got to go to the door and get her. I said, I got to go get her? He said, yes, you got to go knock on the door and get her. I said, Charlie, can't you do it? <laughs> can't you honk the horn? Can't you do something? He goes, no, Kenny, you got to go. That's what guys do when they go out with the girls. I'd never been out with the girls. I didn't know, you know. And uh, he said, you got to go. Well, I got out of the car, and I walked up to Brother Branham's door, and I stood there for just a minute or two, and I want to tell you, Brother, something. This is, now, this is a gospel truth. I was so scared. My knees were shaking. <laughs> I could hear them. And I was trying to think of every way not to go ahead and go through this. <laughs> Finally, I got up enough courage. Walked up, knocked on the door, and I'm, just, I'm petrified because I just know Brother Branham's going to come to the door. But he doesn't. Sister Branham comes to the door. She opens the door. She goes, oh, hello, Kenny. Good to see you. She said, come on in. She said, Sarah, have a seat. She said, Sarah's upstairs. She'll be ready in a minute. She'll be down. Have a seat. Listen, I didn't want a seat. I wanted to get in and get out. <laughs> uh, I've told this to young people all over the world, so I'm sure you young people enjoy this. <laughs> I didn't want a seat. I just wanted to get out of there. But I had to sit there. And the whole time I sat there, I'm looking around, and I'm thinking, where's he at? Where's he at? You know? <laughs> but he didn't come. Man, Sarah come down. She, oh, she's beautiful, you know. And so Sister Branham gave us our instructions, you know. And so we went out the door and went and got in the car. I was feeling pretty good now, you know. I, I, I put Sarah in the front seat between Charlie and I. And... Uh, so we're ready to go. I'm feeling good now. So Charlie backs out of the driveway. And he starts down the street. Now remember I told you there's an empty field between Brother Branham's house and Brother Banks Wood's house. So he starts down the street. And as we get in front of that empty field. I see Brother Branham back there. With Banks Wood. And they've got guns. And about that time, 
about that time, Brother Random screams out, Hey, Charlie, wait a minute, wait a minute. I go, Charlie, go, go. <laughs> Charlie said, No, it's Uncle Bill. We got to stop. It's Uncle Bill. I said, Charlie, can't you go on? Sarah said, Charlie, why don't you go on? <laughs> I said, Go on, Charlie. No, no, it's Uncle Bill. We got to stop. If Uncle Bill says stop. We got to stop. Oh, it seemed like an eternity. Brother Branham and Banks Wood starts walking up to the car from this field. And it seemed like it took forever. And I'm sitting by the passenger door. And that's the side he walks up to. Didn't have a shirt on. Big old hairy chest. Have you ever seen him without a shirt? He's just a big old hairy chest guy. And he had that little old hat he always wore. He's really dirty and everything. Banks walked up. And he had his gun. And Brother Branham had his gun. I'm going, what is going on here, you know? And he sticks his hand in the window to shake my hand. And I'm this far from his face. Now, Brother Bisco said something the other day about in his presence, in the presence of Brother Branham. I don't know if it was because I was in his presence. I don't know if it was because I was scared to death. I don't know what. But when he shook my hand, he goes, How you doing, boy? Well, you didn't have to say it so loud, you know. <laughs> Sound like a mean man, you know. How you doing, boy? <laughs> like I said, I don't know if it's scared or if it's his presence. I tried to speak, and I couldn't speak. <laughs> nothing comes out. I'm trying my hardest to sound like a sensible human being, and nothing comes out. And I, I feel, feel it really bad, you know. And he took my hand and held it for a minute. And he looked in my eyes. And you know how they, they talked about his eyes getting narrow? And I looked in his eyes and there was those lights in his eyes. And I saw the eyes of an eagle. I had been to the Cincinnati Zoo where he saw those eagles and talked about it. The eyes of the eagle. I had been there and seen those eagles. And to me, he had the eyes of an eagle. That's all I could think of. His eagle eyes. And there's something that came over me, brother. I don't know what it was. But it was that presence, I'm sure. But something came over me. As a 15-year-old boy, I knew he knew everything about me. And I felt so bad. <laughs> and I still haven't said anything. And he said... Uh, Still holding my hand. He says, where are you taking her, boy? <laughs> Nothing comes out. He says, oh, so this is that Caps boy I've been hearing so much about. You know, I should have said, yes, sir, you know, or something, you know. I couldn't say nothing. He asked me again. He said, where are you taking her, boy? <laughs> well, Charlie's getting kind of tired of all this. He said, oh, Uncle Bill, leave him alone. <laughs> he said, we're going to go, we're going to go play miniature golf, and then we're going to go out to eat. We'll be home in a little bit. So Brother Branham says, Oh, that's fine. That's real fine. He shook my hand again. He said, you kids have a good time. I still can't say a word. And he, of course, he knows, you know, he knows the situation. And so he starts to turn, him and Banks start to turn away from the car. And I'm starting to feel a little relieved. I feel bad because I haven't said anything. But I'm starting to feel a little relieved. But then he turns back around toward the car window. And this time he takes his gun, his rifle or whatever it was. And he puts it, he puts it through the window. 
And he lays the barrel of that gun on the back of my neck. <laughs> and he says in a real rough voice, he says, you are going to bring her back tonight, aren't you, boy? Gun on your back, man talking to you like that. I finally found my voice. But it was about 10 octaves too high. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> he laughed, and he laughed, and he laughed. He slapped his leg. He said, I got him, Banks. I got him. Bank said, you got him, Bill. You got him. <laughs> that was my first time to, to meet the prophet. So several times after that, that summer, I would get my parents to take me to their house. And Sarah and I would have it set up that me and her would, would see each other, right? But every time I got there, Sister Brandon would have something else for Sarah to do. She'd, she'd always say, no, you just go in the backyard and play with Joseph. Sarah's got a work to do. <laughs> I never got to. And then many times... I'd stay a couple hours and be out in the back with Joseph, and, and uh, then it would, they'd have to go somewhere. He said, uh, Brother Bram said, uh, Kenny, can I take you home? He said, or we can call your mom. I said, no, you can take me home, you know. He'd put me in the car, and he'd joke with me all the way to my house, only about two miles. But he'd joke with me, tell me jokes and say funny things, you know. He's just a common, good, good guy, you know, made me feel so good. And, uh, but that was, that was... That summer was my first time to meet Brother Random face to face. I got to be in their home a little bit and be with the family just a little bit. Not quite like George Smith. But uh, now I treasure those times. And I've had people tell me. I had a brother tell me just out here the, yesterday, I think it was. He said, you know, some of us would give our right arm if we could just meet the man, you know. And I understand that now. But at that time, I didn't, I wasn't comprehending fully. I knew who he was, but I didn't have a revelation of who he was. And I'm thankful to God that as I got older and God dealt with me, that I got a revelation of who he was and of these things that I'd say. Let me tell you one other story about Court. And I just, it's a little story about Brother George's son. I hope he doesn't mind. There's a message, and I, 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 one time I had it wrote down. I don't have it with me. I don't remember when it was exactly. But Brother Random talked about, uh, I, I think he talked about when, when he, well, no, when his, when his father courted his mother, he did so by horse and buggy. You all know courted, that means dated, you know. When his father courted his mother, he did so by horse and buggy. He said, now when I, when I courted my wife, I did so by, I think it was a Model A Ford. One of those Fords, Model A, Model T or something. He said, uh, now when my son Billy courted his wife, he did so with a fancy new sports car. He said, now this is what Brother Bram said. He said, I suppose someday... My grandson will court his wife by jet airplane. Now, we are finding out more and more all the time that even the little things that the man of God said are coming to pass in this generation. And I believe it has to be that because he said, I'm as one born out of season to you Pentecostal people. And I believe this is the season he was born for. These are the times when we see many of those prophecies and many of those things he said coming to pass. Is that right? But he said, I suppose someday my grandson will court his wife by jet airplane. And Brother George's son, he had a son. His name was William. They called him Will. We call him Will today. Will was like a young, a lot, he was like a lot of young people around the message in America, and I'm sure here. You know, people, young people have been brought up in message churches. And, and uh, they become interested 
in the other gender. Which is quite a blessing in this day. <laughs> and uh, Will, I suppose, was like all the other young people. You know, we, we, man, listen. I remember when I was single, I would go to every meeting I could. I only worked enough to get enough gas money to go to the next meeting. And yeah, I was there for the spiritual food and the spiritual benefit. I loved it. But I've also had one eye open. In fact, I had one eye open at Tim Pruitt's youth camp one year. I had one eye open down at his youth camp. I was a counselor, and there was a little girl there that was a camper, and she caught that one eye that was open. But to continue with my story, so Will was like a lot of the young people. He would go to different meetings and so forth. Now, George at that time, they lived in Tucson, Arizona. It's where Will lived. And somewhere along the line, he was in a meeting. I believe it was in Macon, Georgia. And he met a girl, which was Jack Palmer's granddaughter. And, uh, you know, you just, young people, you meet people, right? I got to tell you, I got to stop this and tell you. Stand up. See this young man here? <laughs> <laughs> we was in youth camp in Romania two years ago. <laughs> no, 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 stand up. <laughs> and so we decided to go on a little, uh, little adventure away from the youth camp. And so we were going to the, where, where were we going to the salt mines? Where, where were we going? Some sort of salt mine, salt mine, yeah. Yeah, we were going to a, a big attraction, which is a salt mine there in, in Romania. They've got carousel rides and everything there and so we were all it was it was a couple hours away and we were all just <laughs> we were all tr going in different cars you know and uh, I think I was riding with brother Gabriel and back here and this young man he had his own car and we were all kind of trying to stay together you know <laughs> and he must have had a nice car I don't remember but he would come he would be behind us, and he would come real fast and pass us. And he'd go way down the road. And a little while, he'd slow down again, and we'd catch up to him. And he'd take off and go real fast again. And we wouldn't see him for a while. And pretty soon, he did it again. He'd slow down, and he'd take off and go real fast. <laughs> it's all right if I embarrass you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and so we... He, was, he had passed us, and we were going down the road, and looked up there, and there was a policeman that had a car pulled over, and it was our brother. <laughs> now you can sit down. <laughs> but he had some girls in the car, <laughs> and I think some of those girls are here too, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, message young people, they can be normal young people, you know. All right, back to Brother Will. <laughs> so, and I'm just, I don't know all the details, but I just know how it ended up, okay? And so, Will became friends with, her name's Rennell, right, George? Rennell Palmer, yeah. Will became friends with Rennell Palmer. And uh, from what I can gather, they became friends, and then they became better friends. And then they became better friends. And they became better friends. And the next thing you know, they were in love. Well, there was a problem. Will lived in Tucson, Arizona. She lived in Macon, Georgia. There's almost 2,000 miles between those two cities. What are we going to do? But you know, them Smith boys, they got a little bit on the ball. Pretty smart. Will got a job working with American Airlines. 
And I don't know how it is now, but I think back at that time, if you worked for American Airlines, you could fly free. And from what I understand, and I may be, I think it's right, from what I understand, Will would work all week long at American Airlines, and then come the weekend, he would hop a free jet ride to Macon, Georgia, <laughs> and where they had a little courtship with him and his, his girlfriend, his engaged, or his, his fiance. And he eventually married this girl, and they're living in Johnson City, Tennessee today, and it thereby fulfilling the prophecy where the prophet of God said, Someday, I suppose my grandson will court his wife by jet airplane. <laughs> and we got to move along. I'm, I just kind of cut this short here. In 1963, after the seals were preached, the crowds became so great at the Branham Tabernacle. We would have the young people sitting on the altar in the front of the, the pews. We would have people sitting in the baptistry. We would have people sitting in the Sunday school rooms. We'd have people everywhere. There was people standing along the wall. Sometimes there would be three and four people deep. And it was such a, a, a glorious thing to see that you know, these were long sermons that Brother Branham preached. And a lot of times you could see a brother get up and, and another brother would sit down for a while. And he would get up and give his seat. Uh, really, really Christian attitudes. And, uh, but the, the crowds were, were just so great. And one, one day my father came home and he said, I was in a meeting today with Brother Branham and the deacons. And he said... They asked that all, the, that, that all the young men 13 years of age and older give up their seat. 12 years of age and older, I think. All the young men 12 years of age and older give up their seats. That somebody from out of town or, across the, or out of the country could have a seat to sit and listen to the prophet. He said, and they said, you young people... Uh, can go out in the car and listen to it on the radio because they had the radio broadcast. And there would be, there would be 500, 600 people sitting in cars listening to the message on the car radio because they couldn't get in the church. He said, now you, you just tell your, your boys to, to go out and, and, and uh, sit in the car and, and listen to it on the radio. And uh, so mom and dad decided that I was old enough and mature enough to give up my seat. And go out and listen to the message on the car radio. So I gave up my seat for somebody else. Now we would go out and sit in the car. And probably for the first 15, 20 minutes, half hour, we would listen to the message. Then we would get sidetracked. We'd get to talking and we'd get to walk into the gas station and buy Coca-Cola. And we didn't always listen to the message. Like we would have if we were inside the church. So one day, father come home and he said, Kenny, I want to tell you something. He said, we were in a meeting with Brother Branham. And he said, uh, he wasn't in the original meeting. This is something the deacons did and the trustees did when Brother Branham was out of town. He said, we were in a meeting with Brother Branham and the deacons told him what they had done. How they had asked the young men 12 years of age and older to give up their seat so we'd have more seating for people. And he said, when the, he said, I was in that meeting. He said, when they told Brother Branham that, he said, Brother Branham kind of looked up for a minute. And then he looked back and he said, God will bless those boys for that someday. Now, if a prophet of God says that his grandson will court by jet airplane... It's going to come to pass. The prophet of God says God will bless those boys for that. I stand before you as a spoken word blessing of a prophet of God. I have been tremendously blessed traveling across the world. You know, I always had a desire to travel, see the world. Our family was not wealthy, but... Um, I, I, that was the desire of my heart to travel. So when I started preaching the word, offers started coming. 
funds started coming, by God's grace, I've been to over 50 countries. God has given me the desire of my heart. But that's not the end of the story. Brother Branham died, as, as we know, in 1965. After a while, my father left Jeffersonville and went and started another church. I finished high school. I got a job. Had my own money. Got me a nice sports car. Had my own sports car. I had a 65 Ford Mustang. Y'all don't know what that is. But if you're in America, you know what that is. That's a car. That's got an engine. That's got a four-speed transmission. It's, got, uh, it's, it's jacked up real high. It's got sport wheels on it. It's a real car. I thought I was pretty hot. I had my own job. Had my own car. Had my own money. And I decided that I didn't need church anymore. I quit church. I started running with a rough crowd, a wild crowd. You see, I didn't need church anymore, in my mind. I'll tell you why. Growing up, our family went to church at the Branham Tabernacle every Sunday morning. And every Sunday night. My father was a minister. They used to have what they call cottage prayer meetings. House meetings. And on Monday night, Brother Neville, the pastor, he would preach at a house meeting, a cottage prayer meeting. And my dad would always take the family and go and be the song leader for him. Well, then the next night was Tuesday night. My father preached at a house meeting, a cottage prayer meeting. And Brother Neville would go and lead songs for him. On Wednesday night, we were back at the Branham Tabernacle. On Thursday night, Dad took the family. We'd go over to Junior Jackson's church. On Friday night, they had a men's meeting at Brother Don Ruddle's church. And me being the oldest son, I always had to go with my dad to the men's meeting. Now, Saturday night, I didn't have to go to church. Unless Dad was preaching a revival somewhere, and then I had to go to church Saturday night. So I was... For years, I was in church every night. So when I got to be 18, got my own car, my own money, my own job, I thought, you know, I've had enough of church. I'm a big boy now. I don't need church anymore. I've had enough church to last me for my life. I quit church. I met a little girl that was not a Christian. Now, I want you young people to listen. This is the serious part. I met a young lady that was not a Christian. And I started dating her. And we got married. I wasn't in church. She didn't know anything about church. And I got married. I was about I was 18. I was about ready to turn 19. She was she was 17. We got married. I left home. I had my own place, my own job. I had everything. I didn't need nothing from nobody. I was doing good, I thought. In time, we had two little boys. Married for about four years. Had a little boy three and a little boy two. One Sunday night, when I wasn't in church, there came a knock at my door. It was a police officer. He said, sir, are you Mr. Caps?" I said, yes, sir. He said, I'm sorry to inform you. Your wife has been killed in an automobile accident. was I going to do? I had a little boy three, a little boy two. A 
At the time, I was 22 years old. Young people, you were raised in a, in a godly home. I know you was. That's the reason you're here. God put you in that home for a reason. Listen to your parents. Listen to your pastors. God has never left to one of His own. He's never lost one of His. And if you're a child of God, God's going to get you. You can come hard or you can come easy. Say, maybe, maybe some other kid can do those things and nothing happens. But you're a child of God. God will get your attention. One way or another, God will get your attention, young people. Being a single parent is the hardest job in the world. You don't want to go through it if you don't have to. But I stayed single. And I raised those two boys. They're alive today. One of them's uh, 47. One of them's 46. Living up in Indiana. I've got uh, three grandchildren. I've got one great-grandchild. But it's something you don't want to go through. If God allowed you to be raised in a Christian home, a message home, it's for a reason. God doesn't do anything out of order. Life was hard. Life was hard. Working a full-time job. Getting up early in the morning before I go to work and take the children to my mom's house or whatever. Whoever was taking care of them. Getting off work late. Going picking up the children. Giving them a bath. Giving them everything they need. Giving them dinner. And then this... Next day, the same thing, over and over again. You know, I had a lot of time to think. Life was really hard. But you know, I was raised in the Branham Tabernacle. I knew the prophet. I was in his home. I'd never given my heart to the Lord. I believe we've got young people here. You've been raised in a message home. You go to a church, a message church, and maybe you've never given your heart to the Lord. I hope that's not the case, but I suspect that it is. And one night, Sunday night, in an Indiana cornfield, I walked about three miles from my house and I walked out into the cornfield. The corn was high, it was over my head. I said, Lord Jesus, I, 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 I'm sorry. I've never asked you to come into my life. But if you'll come into my life, I'll live for you. I'll serve you the rest of my life. I walked home that night. I didn't speak in tongues. I didn't shout. I didn't sing. I just walked home that night and went to bed. But the next morning when I got up, there was something in me that told me that for the first time in my life, God had heard my prayer. And young people, when you get serious with God, you'll know that you've heard from God. I got up that next morning and I felt so different. I thought, he's heard my prayer. He's done what I asked him to do. And then it became a mission for me to start studying God's word. I studied it day and night. 
I studied these books and listened to these tapes day and night. I got back into a message church. First church I went to, Brother Colin Brenner, was Brother Ed Hunter in Muncie, Indiana. You know him. God began to deal with my heart. I learned how to praise God. Listen, what I told you this afternoon or this morning, it's not just a story. It's not just something to make you feel good. It's not just something to cause a lot of emotion. It's true. If you will praise God. You say, Brother Ken, are you sure? I'm sure it happened to me. Just praise God. You don't have to be a big fantastic thing. But just praise God in your own way. You need the Holy Ghost. You can't make it in this world without the Holy Ghost. You might have made it 50 years ago. But you're not going to make it in this world without the Holy Ghost. You need the Holy Ghost. We've got tonight. We've got a service tomorrow morning. Is that correct? Tomorrow afternoon. And then tomorrow night. Right? Tomorrow morning and tomorrow evening. And tonight, right? We've got three services left. Young people, I challenge you. Don't leave this convention without making sure that you've made everything right with God. You don't, have to, you don't know that you have tomorrow. We don't know. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just telling you the facts because I've been there. I know what I'm talking about. Don't let this convention pass without you receiving what you have need of from God. You know, as God started to deal with me, I began to think back on all the things I've seen and heard. And I remembered what my dad told me that night. He said, Brother Branham said, God will bless those boys for that someday. God started blessing me. I don't understand it. I don't deserve it. But he has blessed me and blessed me and blessed me. Stayed single for 21 years. God blessed me with a wonderful wife. God blessed me with another little boy. He's 14 years old. I believe he needs the Holy Ghost. Y'all pray for him. But the thing is, I gave up my seat. I just did something for God. I just sacrificed something for God. And God honored it. Young people, find something you can do for God. Find somehow you can make a sacrifice for God. And God will bless you. You don't need a prophet of God telling you. The word of God tells you. Your pastors tell you. Do something for God. God will bless you if you do. Sorry, I've taken for so long. I didn't mean to. I've got other things, but we need to we need to call it to an end. Let me pray as our song leader comes. Father, we approach you now in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we had a great opportunity to preach this. Wonderful group of people from all over Europe, all over the world, here in this convention. Lord, we don't take it lightly. God, I thank you for the privilege of preaching to this portion of the bride of Jesus Christ. God, we just trust. We just trust that something's been said. Something's been done. If just one person comes to God. We believe it'll all be worthwhile. Lord, I thank you for giving me this great opportunity. I thank you, Father, for this opportunity to just tell these few little stories. I trust it'll be a blessing to someone. I trust it'll speak to someone's heart. Lord, I commit these young people. I commit the people in this convention to your care. Lord, may you come and do a work in every life every heart, every soul. Lord, we love you tonight. Lord, as our precious brother George Smith said, if the ministry could just make God real to the people, oh, what could you do? Oh, 
How could you work in people's lives? Lord, that's our challenge as ministers, just to make you real to the people. Lord, we trust something's been said or done to make Christ a living reality. Lord, we ask your blessings upon this group. Lord, we ask your blessings upon the people who've worked so hard. Lord, I work in the convention at home. I know what it's, I know what it's like. I know what it's, it's like to be up all day and all night and making sure everything goes smooth. God, I pray that you would bless Brother Colin Brenner and his family, each and every one, each and every worker from every church. I pray that you would bless them. Lord, in the days to come, may your blessings be poured out upon them. Lord, may they receive whatever they have need of from the, from the eternal God. Lord, we love you. We praise your holy name. We commit it now all to you. In Jesus' name, amen.